I want to introduce Dave Ritter to you now, and I'll ask Dave to come on up here with me. Uh, Dave is the pastor at uh, the church that my mom and stepdad, Art and Ann, are part of in New Jersey. And uh, I got to sit under Dave's preaching for the first time when we got to go visit them last summer. And since then, I've done a lot of listening to different uh, preaching that Dave has had and um, heard lots about things that are going on at the church through uh, my family, and that's been exciting to see. And um, I am extremely eager to have us just sit here and focus in God's Word and see this whole heartbeat of God for missions um, traced out through the Word of God, and I think we're just going to be in for a rich journey. So, without any further ado, let me introduce Dave and ask him to share. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Hey, it's so great to be with you. Uh, it's not my first time to Montana, it's my second, uh, but uh, boy, you, you live in a beautiful place, and uh, I've been enjoying getting to know some of you. Uh, it's just been a warm welcome, and man, am I impressed with the work of Montana Bible College. Uh, you folks are doing great work here, and, and just the model of training people in the local church context using practitioners to do a lot of the teaching, um, mentoring students. I've heard a lot about discipleship. Uh, I am heartily in agreement with that model of educating, training people for ministry. We're going to be in Genesis 11 uh, for a little while this afternoon. Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9, so if you have a Bible with you, you might want to open to that place. Uh, let me just take a moment and pray for this time together in the Word, and then we'll dive in together. Father, we are grateful that we can gather together to talk about your work, and not just to talk about it, but to talk about it in ways that we pray will challenge us and energize us and challenge us to be more engaged in your mission to reach people of every tribe and tongue and language and nation. And we realize, as has just been mentioned, that we stand in the line of a great heritage of those who've gone before us. And as we sense the time of the return of our Savior is drawing near, uh, the, the work becomes all the more urgent. Uh, because we want to take as many people to heaven with us as we can. We want to see the kingdom of the Lord Jesus expand and grow and advance. And so, Lord, we ask your blessing on this time that you'd open our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us in your word today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to put you in the shoes of a rookie missionary in Papua New Guinea. He's a medical doctor, and he is determined to spend his life serving the people of Papua New Guinea uh, in the hopes of winning opportunities to share the gospel with many of those people. His name is Andy. It's 1994. He's just getting started in his work, and he writes a letter to his supporters that uh, talk about his attempts to adjust to a very, very different culture. So I'm going to read a little section of his letter here. It's a, it's a little bit of a lengthy passage, but I, I can't improve on Andy's own words. He says, In the middle of August, my Engen roommate, David, and I had planned a dinner party for some of the men of the village of Laku, where we attend church. The afternoon of the meal before, I drove to Laku to bring the guests back. I was feeling a little bummed out and decided to do some gardening to relax. I cut down some corn stalks that had very young ears on them because they were growing where I did not want them to grow. I gave the small ears of corn to our pigs. <clears throat> I also cut off some taro leaves off of plants that were shading my young avocado and guava trees. I went back and picked up the guests and met David, and when I got back to the house, everyone who came and looked outside became very sullen and quiet. Conversations were few and whispered. It was definitely palpable tension. Uh, David found it very hard to talk to me until I begged him to tell me what the problem was. In Enga culture, if someone cuts down corn before it has been harvested or cuts leaves off of taros or any other food-producing garden plant, it is a clear sign that whoever did it is extremely angry and wants to kill somebody in the house. <laughs> so my garden pruning, to relieve my tension, was read as a wish to kill my roommate. That led to a discussion of cultural differences 
Whew, what a dinner party. I recently discovered another cultural difference. I, had dried, I have had different Engans living with me since I've been here. Their living in the house makes other people feel much more comfortable about coming into the house and visiting me. Obviously, a goal of mine is to learn as much about the culture as possible so that I can share my testimony with understanding. I found out just a few weeks ago that they have also been sharing my toothbrush with me. <laughs> Since then, I've also discovered that Engen guests who have visited the house have used the same toothbrush, mine. I'm trying to be part of the culture, but this was a little bit more than I had in mind. I think some things such as toothbrushes need to be kept personal. I can best summarize the past months by quoting a friend who spent a year working in India. In mission work, there is frequently great joy and fulfillment in being able to live cross-culturally and contribute one's abilities to the development of a nation. However, there are also times of great stress and depression as one's native culture clashes with the new culture. In my friend's words, there have been times that I wish the Marines would storm into the country and airlift me out. Well, that's an honest confession of a rookie missionary as he's trying to get going in ministry. In this conference, we're going to look at this complex assignment, this, the complex nature of this assignment that we have as Christ's church to go and make disciples of all nations. And there are huge challenges involved, you know, to uproot from home, to leave and go to another country, to try to learn a new culture and a new language and get to know people and share Christ with them. I mean, even when you consider your Corinthian opportunity of reaching those of other cultures that God has brought right here to Montana, it's a daunting challenge. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if the whole world spoke the same language and everybody was part of the same culture? It'd be a whole lot easier. It'd be boring. But it would be a whole lot easier to do business, to do research, to preach the gospel. Well, we're looking at a passage of Scripture this afternoon, I think, that helps us understand why this world is such a complicated place and why the, the endeavor of cross-cultural missions is even necessary. The necessity of the church's mission to the nations is explained, at least in part, by what happens here in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel. The passage here not only helps us understand why there are so many diverse languages and cultures in the world, but also helps us understand the necessity, then, of cross-cultural missions. Modern missions is, in essence, helping to undo some of the damage done by man's rebellion against God right here in these early chapters of Genesis. So our purpose this afternoon is threefold. First, to gain some biblical insight into this complicated world that we live in. Secondly to gain an appreciation for the necessity of the cross-cultural missionary task, and thirdly, to grow in our awareness of how we can be involved in what God is doing in the world. You know, part of finding your greatest significance in life is to give yourself to a cause greater than yourself. Well, there's no greater endeavor in all the world than that of making disciples of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. And let me show you why that's so. What takes place here in Genesis 11 obviously comes after the story of the flood, right? And so in Genesis 9, at the end of the flood story, God makes a covenant with Noah never again to destroy the world with a flood, and the rainbow is given as a symbol of that covenant. Later in the same chapter, Noah gets drunk, and his son Ham walks in to find his father passed out drunk and naked, Shem and Japheth, the other two sons of Noah, cover their father's nakedness, and for this, the sons of Ham are cursed, and the sons of Shem and Japheth are blessed. And so we see here the beginning of ancient animosities between nations. If you move into Genesis chapter 10, you learn that the descendants of Noah's three sons become 70 distinct nations, from which all the other nations of the earth descend. It's interesting to me that this narrative accords quite well with what scientists are telling us about the human family. So there's an article that ran in the Philadelphia Inquirer a number of years ago that had the title, Scientists Say Race Has No Basis in Biology. And, and it says this, researchers adept at analyzing the genetic threads of human diversity report that the concept of race, the source of abiding cultural and political divisions in American society simply has no basis in fundamental human biology. 
Their controversial conclusion grows out of a more precise understanding of the underlying genetics of the human species and how surface dimensions of skin color, hair, and facial features, which may loom so large in daily life, have nothing to do with the basic biology of human differences. Biologically, we are saying, in essence, that race is no longer a valid distinction, says Solomon H. Katz of the University of Pennsylvania, an anthropologist. A declaration by the American Association of Physical Anthropologists summing up what scientists currently believe about race states in part, all human beings belong to a single species, homo sapiens, and share a common descent. Isn't it nice that scientists have finally begun to catch up with what the book of Genesis has been saying for 3,000 years? If the Genesis record is to be believed, then the whole human race traces its roots through Noah and his three sons. There is no biological basis for the diversity of races, cultures, and languages. So what does explain it? I propose that what biology can't explain, Genesis 11 can. And so let's take a look at the passage, and then we'll, we'll talk about it together. It says, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they came to one another, and they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which, which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, so that they may not understand one another's speech." So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. What are we seeing here? That the greatest endeavor the world will ever know, namely the Great Commission, was necessitated by another great human endeavor that occurred in these years following the flood. The necessity of going into all the world and making disciples of all nations is a response to the confusion of language and dispersing of peoples that takes place right here in Genesis 11. The Great Commission is a response to what I'm going to be calling the Great Collusion. So let's compare and contrast these two great movements as a way of better understanding the task that is before us today. Let's begin by talking about the great collusion in Genesis 11, this movement brought about by people coming together in defiance of God. And then we'll double back and look at the Great Commission and compare how we can become instrumental in undoing the impact of the great collusion. So beginning with the great collusion, well, whose idea was it? Man's. I mean, that's clear from the story, right? This was not something ordained of God. This was something that mankind took uh, upon itself. It says in verse 2, they migrated from the east. They found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, this is a conversation they're having on themselves. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and, and let us build ourselves a city with a tower in its top to the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. All this let us language uh, clearly shows that this is an idea that they cook up together. What's evident here is, not that, is that they are not following God's instructions, but are charting their own course apart from God. So from the get-go, the great collusion is man's idea. What's the strategy behind the great collusion? To unite in one place, to stay together. That's clear from the text as well. Verse 2 talks about how they migrated to this land of Shinar, and they settled there. Uh, this is a great place. Let's just stay here. It goes on in verse 4 to say that let's build this tower and this great city, make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. That's what they're trying to prevent. So the strategy is let's keep everybody together. Man's idea, keep everybody together, the result is rebellion against God. 
rebellion against God because clearly this is contrary to what God commanded for the human race. Going all the way back to uh, God's mandate to Adam, he blessed Adam and Eve. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. The same uh, basic command was given to Noah right after the flood. Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But that's not what they're saying. They're saying, no, let's stay here. Let's keep everybody together. Let's make a name for ourselves. In other words, let's not do what God says. Let's assert ourselves against God's will, make a name for ourselves, and keep from being dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And for that, they believed they needed a rallying point, namely a city and a tower. Uh, a tower that reaches to the heavens. Verse 4 says, then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Presumably, we're talking a ziggurat here because Shinar was in Mesopotamia, and, and it must have been in some kind of fantastic structure. Their, their goal was that it would reach to the heavens. You know, they're talking skyscraper kind of dimensions here. And the interesting thing is that it's not necessarily a temple devoted to the worship of another god, but rather a monument to their own greatness. Again, this is man trying to assert himself in the face of God, take the place that belongs only to God. And this tower is meant as kind of a, a, a way of pointing the way back to Shinar, you know, sort of that beacon that will point them back to the center of their unified society to keep them from getting divided. Now, language plays a very important role in all of this because, as you see in the beginning of the story, they start off speaking the same language. It's the one language that makes this collusion possible because they all speak the same language and the same words. Not only is it a common language, but it's the same vocabulary. And God himself is concerned by the progress they're making in this rebellion against him. The fact that they all speak the same language facilitates this collusion and so in verse 5, you have the Lord coming down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built, and he's impressed. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing they propose will now be impossible for them. Apparently, this tower that they were building was, was something really impressive, and God looks at what they've accomplished and concludes that something has to be done to slow them down. And, and they're, both their technological advances, but even more so, their rebellion against him. Man is indeed a remarkable creation of God. As David says in, in Psalm 8, you know, we were created just a little lower than the angels with remarkable minds, but also with a penchant for using those minds to find increasingly ingenious ways to defy God. I read a book this summer that I, I really recommend. If you're into aviation at all or into history at all, David McCullough's book, uh, The Wright Brothers, an excellent read. McCullough's a great historical writer. And uh, it was timely that I read The Wright Brothers this summer because my family uh, and I were going to the Outer Banks of North Carolina on vacation this summer, and we were one town down from Kitty Hawk. There's a great Wright Brothers memorial and a museum there, and you can see where the first Wright Brothers flights took place. It's a, it's a wonderful place to visit. But this summer I learned the story of, of really the hard work that the Wright Brothers went, figuring out the mystery of heavier-than-air controlled flight and the different technological problems that had to be solved. They started off by uh, flying kites, and then they flew gliders off the hills of Kill Devil Hills, and, um, and yet they, they just weren't getting anywhere in their experiments. They had gone to Kitty Hawk for several years in a row because the winds were especially favorable, the weather was good for what they were trying to accomplish. But they reached a point in 1902 where at the end of the season they returned home to Ohio, uh, where they were from, and they were so frustrated that Wilbur Wright said to his brother Orville, I doubt that man will fly for another thousand years. They were that frustrated, that far away from achieving their goal. Well, they built a wind tunnel in their bicycle repair shop in Ohio, 
And they started to experiment with different wing designs that winter. And lo and behold, they had a tremendous breakthrough. And they took that new technology and they built a new Wright Flyer, a, a new model of, of their aircraft. They figured out how to get a, an engine that was powerful enough but light enough into this aircraft to be able to power the thing. They had solved the, the problem of control. They had solved the problem of lift. They had solved the problem of, of propulsion. They put it all together. And on December 17th, 1903, this is the moment that the Wright Flyer first took flight. It flew only about 90 feet the first time. But they got it up two or three more times that day, and with every flight, it went a little bit farther, and they knew that they had solved the problem of controlled, powered, heavier-than-air flight. Now look at that thing. Incredibly rickety. Within 10 years, there was a major war going on in Europe, and this is what had happened to the airplane. It had come that far in 10 years. Can you imagine the ingenuity of the human mind to first of all solve the problem of flight and then to go from the right flyer to stop with camels and Fokker triplanes in, in 10 years? Fast forward 30 years, World War II. And now the aircraft are looking like this, the P-51 Mustang. I mean, just incredible advances in technology, enabling planes to go farther, faster, more power, higher altitudes, more destructiveness in just 40 years after the time that the Wright brothers first flew. 66 years after the time the Wright brothers flew, we put a man on the moon. Just 66 years. And of course, you know, today, we take air travel for granted. It's, it's easy, it's slick, it's routine. And where is it all going in the future? Time will tell. But it's amazing what the human mind can do. I mean, think about advances in just digital technology. My brother, who has a PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Illinois, was reflecting on the 20th anniversary of the successful defense of his dissertation. And he uh, talked on a Facebook post recently about how uh, 20 years ago, to model his thesis of how rocket engines burn, he had to get 200 hours of time on a Cray supercomputer to be able to model uh, his, his uh, thesis. 200 hours on a Cray supercomputer, which was regarded as the top of the line, most powerful computer of the day. And Jeff says, now you've got that much computing power on your iPhone. We've come that far in 20 years. Where is it going to go? Well, you can understand maybe a little bit of, of God's concern here. Because technological advances, even if they are good advances, isn't it crazy how they often end up serving man's sinful purposes? And so you've got aircraft that are capable of doing incredible things, including delivering a nuclear bomb, or raining down barrel bombs on, on Syrian civilians. You have uh, amazing technology that you carry around in your pocket, and it can accomplish incredible good. But it is also responsible for the rapid acceleration of pornography around the world and the sexual addiction, addiction of millions. And so God you know, looks at this propensity on the part of man to accomplish great things, to use his mind to do amazing things. And God look, looks at this right here in Genesis 11, and he sees this as merely the beginning, the beginning of what mankind will do in rebellion against him. And so what does God do in response? In verse 7, it says, Come, let us go down and there confuse their language. Language is the key. If all mankind speaks one language and they can collaborate and collude this way, there's no telling what they're going to do and how far their rebellion will go. Let us go down and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. You know, part of what slowed down the, the uh, solving of the problem of powered flight was the fact that you had Germans and Americans and French people all working on the problem, but they weren't communicating very well because they didn't speak each other's language. They couldn't share the technology. 
And, but God is saying here, if we're going to slow this thing down, if we're going to nip this in the bud, if we're going to keep man from using his brain to collaborate in wickedness against me, then we'll confuse their language. They won't be able to communicate with each other. God's action here may be viewed as punitive, but it seems as if it's preventative at the same time. If people speak different languages, they can't understand each other, it'll be harder for them to advance technologically, and it will make it more difficult for them to collude in their rebellion against God. So God, in effect, uses the confusion of language and the nationalism that results from it to make it more difficult for the human race to unite in rebellion. Any school teacher will tell you, if you've got uh, a couple of little boys sitting there in the classroom, and they're always, you know, collaborating on disrupting the class, what do you have to do with those boys? You have to separate them so that they can't collaborate in that wickedness in your classroom. And that's essentially what God is doing here. And it says in verse 8, so the Lord dispersed them from over uh, over the face of the earth, and they left off building that city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because There the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So what's the outcome of this rebellion against God? Well, it started off with one language. It ends up with many languages, cultures, and nations. In verse 4, they're intent on building a city with a tower in it, making a name for themselves, lest they be dispersed over the face of all the earth. But that's just what they bring on themselves. If they won't obey God and multiply and fill the earth, God will confuse their language and disperse them far and wide so that they will fulfill his mandate to fill the earth. And so the necessity of the Great Commission is rooted in the Great Collusion. Man's idea to unite at Shinar in rebellion against God Rallying around a tower, reaching to the heavens, leads to the confusion of language and the dispersion of mankind around the globe, forming many cultures and many nations. Now, in stark contrast to the great collusion, then, is Jesus' great commission to his church. So let's do a little compare and contrast. If the great collusion was man's idea, then the great commission is God's idea. From the very beginning, you see that in Matthew 28. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. And what does Jesus do with all that authority? The Father has invested me with all this authority. What am I going to do with it? I'm going to tell you to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age." So the great collusion is man's idea. The great commission is all God's. Where the great collusion attempted to keep people from being scattered over the face of the earth, it attempted to keep people together, the great commission sends us into all the world. And you see that, you know, in Matthew's version of the great commission, Mark, Luke, Acts, they all have this emphasis on going, don't they? So Jesus says in in verse uh, 19, go make disciples of God all nations. You see it in Mark. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. You see it in Luke. Jesus says that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You see it in Acts 1 verse 8. But you will receive power and the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, where the, the point of the great collusion was to keep everybody together and the point of the great commission is to send people to the nations, the result of the great collusion was rebellion against God. The result of the great commission is reconciliation to God. And that's very clear in the New Testament as well, isn't it? Paul says, for instance, in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 20, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God has made his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The great collusion was a rebellion against God. The great commission is about reconciling people to God. 
Missionary Susie Holbert uh, tells about how she always believed as a mom that one of her chief responsibilities as a mom was to instill in her children a burden uh, for their lost friends. And she apparently did a good job because one day her 10-year-old Ryan was out playing in the backyard with his friends, and they were driving imaginary race cars. When Ryan came bounding into the house and yelled, Mom, Mom, you got to come quick. Isabel wants to accept Jesus into her heart. And she's kind of skeptical and said, but Ryan, weren't you just playing race cars? And he said, yeah, Mom, but our cars got in this wreck, and the accident was really bad. And I asked Isabel if she'd go to heaven if she died, and she didn't know. And so I, I told her how she could know, and now she wants to ask Jesus into her heart. That's what ambassadors of reconciliation do. That's what the Great Commission results in. Instead of encouraging others in their rebellion against God, followers of Jesus help others be reconciled to God. Now, we said that the uh, Great Collusion had a rallying point, a tower. Well, the Great Commission has a rallying point too, doesn't it? A cross suspended between heaven and earth. Paul talks about this in Ephesians 2.16, where he, he talks about how he might reconcile us both to God, Jews and Gentiles, reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Paul says here that it is the cross of Christ that not only reconciles us to God, but reconciles Jew and Gentile to one another. Ultimately, what brings diverse people together is not a tower symbolizing their shared rebellion against God, but a cross symbolizing the common need of the grace of God. I love a little piece by George McLeod that goes like this. He says, I simply argue that the cross be raised again at the center of the marketplace as well as on the steeple of the church. I am recovering the claim that Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves on a town garbage heap at the crossroads of politics so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew and in Latin and in Greek, and at the kind of place where cynics talk smut and thieves curse and soldiers gamble because that is where he died and that is what he died about and that is where Christ's people ought to be and what the church ought to be about. So you have the great collusion, man's idea to keep people together resulting in rebellion against God, rallying around a tower. You have the Great Commission, God's idea, sending Jesus' followers into all the world, resulting in the reconciliation of sinners to God, rallying around an old rugged cross. Here's one more contrast. While in the Great Collusion, one language was confused and became many, the work of the Great Commission is to proclaim one message in many languages. The confusion of language in Genesis 11 is part of what makes the fulfillment of the Great Commission so challenging, right? But from the first day the church went to work in obedience to that commission, the effects of Babel began to get reversed. Look at what happened on the day of Pentecost, for instance. Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 5, you know, the apostles are filled with the Holy Spirit. They begin speaking in other languages, and it says, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under the heaven. All of the nations of battle are represented there. And at this sound, the sound of the apostles speaking, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Galileans don't know anything. And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own, mighty, in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And so in the shadow of the Tower of Babel, people suddenly looked at each other quizzically, not able to understand each other. They, they kind of wandered off in different directions because they were no longer able to converse. Uh, you know, they, they drift to the ends of the earth, apparently grouped with others that they could understand, living in isolation from one another, forming cultures, intermarrying and developing common physical traits that we probably now mistake as distinct races. 
but in the shadow of the temple, in the shadow of the temple, that Pentecost Sunday after Jesus rose from the dead, people from all over the world hear a single message, each hearing it in his own native language, a message that transcends geography and culture and language and race, the message that wicked men put Jesus to death on a cross, but God raised him from the dead, conqueror of sin and death for us, making him both Lord and Christ. And those who accepted his message repented and were baptized, 3,000 people from many different cultures and languages came together as one people of God in Christ, beginning that day. So whereas the conclusion the outcome of the great collusion was many cultures, many languages, and nations. The outcome of the Great Commission is one people of God, of every language and tribe and tongue and nation, come together before the throne. The work that was begun on the day of Pentecost goes on today. And Christ will build his church until the day he returns for her. A day is coming when a new song will be sung in honor of the king. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. What I want for us today is a fresh appreciation of the fact that God has a marvelous plan for the nation's that involves us. The Great Commission is the greatest endeavor the world has ever known, and we get to have a piece of that. God is undoing the confusion of Babel by taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, and he's using ordinary people like you and me to do it. The smoky confusion of Babel continues to clear as language barriers are overcome so that more and more people can hear the gospel of Christ being proclaimed in their own heart languages. The distance between people caused by Babel shrinks a little bit every day as ambassadors of Christ risk entering into cultures of others to incarnate the gospel and help others see Jesus. Whether that requires getting on a plane and moving to another country or walking across the street to introduce yourself to an immigrant family, God wants to use each of us to reconcile people to God from every tribe, every language, every people, and every nation Steadily, steadily, the impact of Babel is being reversed as Jesus continues to use us to build his church. You know, one of the major pieces of this is Bible translation work. And it's being done through different missionary agencies, and of course the Wycliffe Bible translators are probably best known for that work of undoing the damage of Babel. If you go on their website, you'll find some interesting statistics. They say, for instance, more than 1,300 languages have access to the New Testament or some portion of the Scripture in their own languages. Sounds pretty good, right? More than 500 languages have complete translations of the Bible, but there are almost 7,000 languages in use in the world today. They say about 180 million people need Bible translations to begin in their own languages. More than 2,300 languages across 131 countries have active translation and linguistic development work happening right now. That's a phenomenal number. But more than 1,800 languages still need a Bible translation work to begin. That's a daunting challenge. Wycliffe's vision is to do everything possible to see Bible translation in every language still needing one by the year 2025, just 10 years from now. And to help that goal be met, I, I learned this uh, just uh, a few months ago. To help this goal be met, Wycliffe Associates has undertaken an ambitious project to leverage technology. That same technology that is sometimes used for such evil purposes is now being used to provide translations to language groups that otherwise would have to wait years for a Bible translator to be trained. One of the missionaries uh, supported by our church is working on this project called Translation Studio. It's an app that you'll be able to get on your, on your iPhone or, or your, uh, uh, your Droid very soon. And, and the way this works is that you've got um, Bible translation notes now uh, 
uh, made available in several gateway languages like French and Spanish and English. Uh, there are many people around the world that speak these various gateway languages. And, and so bilingual people, with the help of this app on their phone, will be able to take Bible translations and use translation helps that are being created right now to be able to begin a translation in their own native language where one doesn't currently exist. And so all it will take is a motivated uh, native speaker who also knows one of these gateway languages and has access to, to a smartphone, and they'll be able to start doing a translation. These translations, they know, will not be as polished as trained translators may provide, but by means of an app on a phone, a good enough translation can begin speaking in the heart language of those who know nothing about Jesus today. To me, that's a phenomenal development. You know, the fog of Babel is lifting. The goal of having the gospel available in every language seemed unattainable just a few years ago, but now with the help of technology, it is within reach. Well, you know, Bible translation is just one small piece of the puzzle of reversing the impact of Babel. But all of us who follow Jesus are called to the Great Commission. Some of us will give our lives to serve cross-culturally in another country to accomplish that mission. Some will befriend those hiding in plain sight right here among us, those who are appointed salvation living unseen within our own communities. Some of us will pastor churches mobilizing our congregations to pray, to give, to go. The one thing you can't do during this conference is to sit back and think that the mission of the church is somebody else's thing to do. We've already been called. We've been commissioned as his church to go and make disciples of all nations. The, the question is not whether God's plan for the nations involves you. It's only a question of how. How does it involve you? So listen carefully for what God may be saying to you these couple of days we're together. We each have a part to play in the greatest endeavor the world has ever known, the work of making disciples of all nations, the work of reversing the impact of Babel, the work that will result in people of every tribe and people and language and nation giving glory to Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Let's pray. Lord, from the earliest pages of Genesis, we begin to see that you have a plan, that it's one continuous story from cover to cover, your marvelous plan for blessing all the peoples of the earth through your son Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to get on board with your plan. As you continue writing your story, of salvation for the nations. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to each of our hearts in one of these sessions, here in this room or in one of the breakout sessions, speak to our hearts about some new way that we can contribute to the greatest endeavor the world has ever known, making Christ known to the nations. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.